Hello and welcome back to the ROI channel, the channel that's obsessed with the art and science of return on investment. Today, just put a few thoughts together. I've been working on this for a while. Um, that's why I haven't been as active as usual. Talking about the growing pressure on food prices and the growing food and energy crisis. So it's an er energy crisis now, uh, which we at, at Crassus have been positioned for uh, in advance. And so looking forwards into 2022, 2023, we're looking at what else will be the second and third order consequences. And I believe that food prices uh, may have a lot of upward pressure on them for quite some time as this energy crisis does not seem to uh, want to abate anytime soon. So we're launching a, a little series, we're going to call it Special Ops, so Special Opportunities, and it's how to profit from the food trade. That's what I'm going to be talking about today. If you haven't already liked and subscribed to the channel, please do so. It helps get the uh, YouTube algorithms up. And if you want to see more of the content, uh, it helped me to build the algorithm so I, I can continue to do that. Okay, so it's not going to be uh, about the eToro portfolio as such today. Uh, I'm going to be talking more about... Um, a general macro view and then some different ideas that I have. Uh, some will be covered in the crisis portfolio that I manage on eToro and some will just be simply things that I'm doing personally and with uh, um, investments I have outside of that portfolio. So uh, some important um, philosophical concepts, I suppose, second and third order consequences. Uh, if you read a lot, Howard Marks talks about everyone just thinks first order consequences and that's it. There's an event happen, cause and effect, and, and that's it. Very few people expand and extrapolate their thinking out to second and third and even fourth order consequences. So the consequences of the consequences. And that's what we're gonna be talking about today or at least touching on. So we know at the moment we have, uh, we've had COVID which has led uh, along with other things to a supply dearth in energy, okay? So LNG, uh, coal, oil, etc. They've been under a lot of pressure because there hasn't been the uh, capex put forth over the last few years in order to increase the supply. So we were already sitting on a, a supply crunch before COVID came. Then uh, basically, you know, coal mines and uh, explorers and so on and so forth, the developers and producers shut down and there was no production. And it seemed okay at the time because there was also no demand because, or not no demand, but there was a reduced demand because people were stuck at home. Now we're in the midst of a full-blown energy crisis. So it seems because uh, if you if you read a lot of Go Rosen's analysis, which I highly suggest that you do, it, we may be looking at a point either into next year or the year after where the demand actually exceeds not only supply and inventories, but pumping capacity, uh, which is a pretty scary thing moving forward. So energy prices have shot up. Why is that important for food? So uh, energy is a huge input cost for fertilizers. Okay, so 70, even up to 80% of uh, nitrogen-based fertilizers require a huge amount of energy. Okay, and so that, uh, if I think uh, into that third order, consequences okay what's the effect of that we're looking at uh, potentially affected crop yields moving into 2022 or 2023 and depending on who you talk to you may even have um, a one-to-one -one ratio in terms of the the de decrease or increase uh, of fertilizer up until a point um, it can be on a one-to-one -one ratio uh, or effect ratio for the crop so if you halve your fertilizer you may even halve the crop depending on again who you talk to and the type of um, the produce that you're, you're looking to plant. So if we conceptualize this as to where we are at the end of 2021, we've already had increased heating and cooling costs, energy prices going through the roof, and we're at this dichotomy between you know how much energy is going to be diverted towards heating and cooling and travel, and how much is going to be available for the production of fertilizers, and then leading into the next year, how much um, of the inflation of those costs will be able or unable to be absorbed by the um, agricultural producers. So we're thinking in my mind in a very simplistic uh, sense that we'll have a decreased nitrogen application to crops because we think that farmers will not be able to uh, basically buy as much fertilizer and use as much fertilizer as they have in the past. So speaking to, uh, I live in a, a rural center in uh, Victoria, in Australia, and just speaking to uh, anecdotally to people in um, fertilizer companies and um, I suppose farmer supply stores around and, and the, the prices have just gone through the roof. So it'd be interesting to see who absorbs and who is able to pass on those costs. Uh, thinking that lower yields and supply will be um, 
will be prevalent coming into the next year. So what will that do to food prices is the obvious effect of the next effect. And we have a, a potential supply and demand imbalance from the uh, reduced crop yields, uh, purely assuming a decreased application of fertilizer with farmers trying to save on the costs. So the broad farmers seem to get squeezed in the middle. They uh, will not be as confident they can pass on 100% of the cost to the end consumer. And so they're going to look to try to, to cut their costs somewhere. Uh, a huge part of that will be fertilizer, but it will also be the operational expenses, which we'll talk about in a moment. And the simple fact of inflation of other things. So we talk about OPEX, like diesel, etc. The inflation of everything that the farmer needs uh, to buy in order to produce uh, a crop uh, has gone up thanks to uh, to economic inflation that we've seen over this year and the CPI rising over six points uh, in the US. It's being felt across the across the globe. That obviously is before we take into account the, the elephant in the room when it comes to agriculture, and that's the weather. So we've got all these obstacles ahead of us before we even take into account the, the element of randomness being the, the weather. So we need to ask ourselves good questions, and a good question is, okay, who's going to profit? Who's going to get squeezed? And we think that the middlemen and the farmers perhaps will be squeezed. They'll have increased cost of goods sold, uh, at a higher rate at which they can increase the price of their produce potentially. And so if we're looking at investment opportunities, can we find wholesalers, retailers, primary producers maybe with a large amount of brand power that will enable them to pass on those costs to the end consumer? And uh, an objective metric that we'll be using to measure that will be the free cash flow conversion. So if their sales go up and the EBITDA goes up, that's all well and good. But if your cost of goods goes up even more, your margins may start to shrink. So we're asking ourselves, okay, who's got a good track record of having a high free cash flow conversion, which is the amount of free cash flow you can generate from your EBITDA uh, typically is the best way to, to look at that. Energy prices, okay, spoiler, they're not going down in case you thought that uh, Biden releasing the, <laughs> the pittance of the, the SPR is going to actually affect uh, the energy crisis in which we find ourselves. Uh, wake up from that slumber because it's not going to happen. We may delay the inevitable with another lockdown. So part of the uh, economy's use of energy will be curtailed because uh, there'll be less travel and people will be at home. So we'll still be going through quite a bit of uh, quite a bit of energy, guys. It's not as if you don't use energy when you're at home. The, the shale, well, that tap has been uh, well and truly turned off. The Dems have crushed the industry since taking over. So the U.S. is now uh, energy dependent when they were uh, energy independent. And so it's not as if they can turn to the shale region and just uh, click of the finger and start that up overnight. There's going to be a lag if... Uh, in 2024, there's a new government and they go back to the previous policy of exploring through shale. Uh, it, it doesn't mean that you can just, you know, press a button and supply automatically comes back online. And in the meantime, we may be experiencing a, a huge gap. We've got the ESG guys, okay, the cartels uh, that are, um, in my opinion, anyway, obviously engaging in discriminatory lending practices if you're... Um, a solar farm that wastes uh, a heap of capital and you know, has pretty uh, pretty pathetic uh, IRRs and energy return on energy input, they'll lend you all the money you want uh, because it's it's fashionable at the moment. But of course, if you're an oil and gas producer, they have stopped lending to you. Or if you saw the video that I did for Ovintiv and we used the cost of capital as our discount rate, you saw it was like 17, which is a huge cost of capital versus um, you know the, the other businesses that I break down in these videos. We've got 50 major lenders discriminating against oil and gas, meaning that you know, if you can't get the financing, you're not going to be able to produce or you know, explore to bring on new production into the future. And there's a huge lag time just because you strike oil doesn't mean you're going to start pumping it out and putting it into global supply. Uh, and 140 uh, or more uh, are against uh, lending to coal. So coal's gone through the roof. I don't know if you've been keeping track of that commodity. And so now you're at this uh, dichotomy where obviously people don't really want to use coal. Okay, China and India don't preferentially choose coal because they like it. They do it because it's cheaper and they don't have the means of uh, supplying energy to the population for all its uh, important purposes. And so they go with whatever's cheaper. Even when natural gas is cheaper, they, they opt for natural gas where they can. But guess what? Natural gas has gone through the roof as well uh, because of the, the dearth of supply. Uh, okay, we touch on it here. OPEC Plus unable to meet demand. They're missing their quotas. And every time they pump up their 
supply, they start to draw down on inventory. So they're a hell of a lot of uh, half and puff, but there's huge questions being asked as to whether they actually have the spare capacity which they uh, state that they have. Peak supply instead of peak demand is what we've got. Eric Nuttall talks about this quite a lot. Uh, very good uh, person to follow in this space if you're not already doing so. We thought that we were going to have peak demand by now, and then we we're going to you know, seamlessly, magically uh, ride off into the sunset using you know, solar and wind. Obviously, that's um, you know, it was a pipe dream. It's not going to happen. And we're starting to realize, actually, instead of peak demand, we've got peak supply coming online. When we had the reopening in 2022, uh, Rosen's estimating about 101.6 million barrels a day which will uh, be chewing through, okay, so it'll be higher than 2019, it'll be chewing through uh, the inventories and the, the reserve supply. So things could get uh, quite scary in terms of uh, uh, scraping, quite literally scraping the barrel in terms of access to oil. Fertilizer. The best performing commodity over the last nine months, okay, so urea is up 200% and we have uh, phosphate, and potash up 160 percent gas in europe's up sixfold okay made a huge uh return on natural gas contracts and that can account for between 70 to 85 percent of the input cost for ammonia which is a nitrogen rich fertilizer the producers are cutting production by about 40 percent so this is the fertilizer producers uh norwegian producer yara and uh, borealis they simply you know gas is too expensive they can't afford to get the energy they need to manufacture the fertilizer and so uh, again adding to this supply demand imbalance it's going to mean there's less fertilizer available demand will increase as farmers start to see high pr commodity prices which they are they're going to want to plant more and more and open up more space for agricultural purposes but if you can't get the fertilizer obviously your yields are going to be terrible so it's, it's a, a real um, <laughs> it's a doozy, that's for sure. Uh, we have, uh, as I said, uh, potash and uh, phosphate are also very important and they get affected in this, uh, much the same way. China and Russia stopping exports. So if you thought that, uh, okay, things are bad in the US because energy is high in Europe, China and Russia will come to our aid and start exporting more. Uh, they're not going to do that. They have their own needs that they need to fulfill. And so instead of diverting uh, fertilizer to the export market, they're going to keep it for their uh, domestic production. And China, by the way, supplies 60% of the world's fertilizer. So that is, again, uh, really going to eat into the supply. And the energy, again, energy ration between heating and fertilizer production. You've got this dilemma. Do you heat your house? Do you keep, you know, vulnerable citizens alive do you divert that to fertilizer production because we need to be able to feed the population huge questions being asked and they're not uh, there are no easy answers at the moment there we are this gives a visual representation of what i said before china supplies 60 percent of the world's phosphate based fertilizer and over half of the urea and uh, yeah it's not even close so you see the the usual suspects there and china is dominating these exports so what happens when they curtail their production or stop their exports entirely and focus on their domestic production interesting question here's the operational expense so it's not just the cost of fertilizer although that is the main uh, input uh, factor for your crops you need to be able to fill your tractors with diesel your harvesters your, your machinery and you know diesel prices are going through the roof oftentimes you'll need transport and freight to move your produce um, to a processing or to you know whichever market you're going to use and so freight costs are going to go up because diesels uh, and gas has gone through the roof so it's it's interesting here we look at glyphosate prices up nearly threefold in iowa so to put that into perspective, uh, last year, $17 per gallon is now a, uh, showing a price tag of $50 per gallon. And so that's going to eat into your, your margins for sure. Northwest Indiana, glyphosate prices have seen uh, a threefold increase uh, now at $80 per gallon. So insane. I don't know what's going to happen, uh, but I think it's fair to say that food prices are going north rather than south, at least in the near term future. So this is what we know thus far. So when we look at this uh, before exploring further, so a priori, we're going to say, um, okay, we expect these supply pressures uh, to increase and the demand presumably would say the same, although with an increasing population may uh, actually continue to tick up higher. What are the farmers going to do in the face of increase? 
increased cost of fertilizer. We expect them to uh, want to plant more crops because commodity prices are higher, but maybe they won't do that uh, because they'll sit down and do the numbers and say, okay, they're gonna get more for their crops potentially, but if they have a bad weather season or um, they guaranteed increase input costs, uh, maybe they'll decide to reduce uh, and scale back. So this is the where you get to the permutations on the orders of your thinking. So if you're going uh, first order, then you've got the second order, which is the effect of the effect, and the effect of the effect of the effect, uh, and then you can branch out. So you may have, we've used one effect as a ring, but think of uh, sort of binary little outcomes coming off that, and you have different permutations. So here's an example. Uh, corn is a very nitrogen intensive crop, much more than soybeans, for example. So if you have a 50% uh, less nitrogen applied to your crop, that may lead to as much as a 50% cent redu uh, cent, reduction in your crop yields for corn. And obviously, farmers out there will know more about that than I do. This is just what I've been able to, to piece together. So the, there may be some, some sensitivity to that number. So then you start to say, well, if you're a farmer, what do you do? Do you say, well, okay, normally I'd do corn, but maybe I'm gonna scale back on my corn and plant more soybeans because soybeans are doing pretty well and I, I need to be able to make up my, my cost somewhere, but corn is just, it just eats up too much nitrogen. So we start to think of those permutations and we say, well, if you've got an increased corn price, maybe you'll have an increase in soybeans relative to corn. And so you might actually see a decrease in soybean price when the supply is able to meet the demand. So you may be looking at some, some long short scenarios, you might short soybeans uh, and long corn as an example, I'm not planning on doing that. Um, but these are the things that you want to take into, into account. The US Department of Agriculture estimates 92.7 million acres of corn planted in the US for 2021. That's up 2% from last year. Co uh, costs have gone up a hell of a lot more than 2%. Soybean area planted is projected at 87.6 million acres, which is up 5%. Uh, so there we start to see some empirical evidence to support that idea that maybe um, farmers will start to rotate the types of crops with which they plant. Looking through uh, Go Rosen's co uh, crop reports for Q3 2021, record yields are forecasted for 2021, 179.5 bushels to an acre. Now, this is like saying you're going to get a record. Don't worry about it. We're going to get the best yield we've ever had and it'll all be fine. And they've revised this down three times since then. Okay, so it's a, it's a bit of a fantasy. So if you're relying on getting through only by having a record <laughs> Yeah, season that's incredibly dangerous and so um, what I like to do with a lot of my thinking is use a Bayes theorem uh, which essentially suggests instead of waiting for more and more data and gathering it and putting it through uh, the bell curve and sensitivity you start off with a likely hypothesis using the data that you have and then you change that according to new data as it comes in that either confirms or refutes uh, the initial hypothesis so if we were to, to say, for example, in this case, we were saying, uh, look, we think fertilizer will go up uh, as a result of energy prices, and we think that that will result in reduced corn crop yields because corn is very sensitive. The data with the U.S. Uh, Department of Ag uh, that I mentioned just above, that would uh, increase our confidence in the hypothesis. Uh, if that were to come in uh, and say that corn um, acreage had increased uh, over and above that of soybeans, we would have to decrease our confidence in the original hypothesis because that would refute it. Okay, it's simple enough. It, it sounds complicated. It's not as complicated as it sounds. But what it does do is allow us to adjust our position over time based on the incoming data. And with something as sensitive as the, you know, the future market and, and crop yields, you need to be able to do that because things change on a, a daily basis. Okay, so demand on the demand side of things, that one's a pretty easy one. I spent a lot of time talking about the supply. Demand is growing, population growth, and the percentage of the population with income enough to buy uh, more food is also growing in most places around the world. We have global cooling conditions, which might actually be worse for crop production. Uh, because if you get frost, let me tell you, as a the son of a, an orchardist, it, it, it just destroys it, okay? <laughs> Everything can be looking good. You can have you know great rain, you can have all the ideal conditions, the fruit starts to bud nicely and you get a frost or you get a hail, that can um, completely wipe out an entire year's worth of, um, of growth or produce. 
So what's going to happen to the prices? We need to uh, make a decision. Do we think prices are more likely to go high or more likely to go low? And how do we play that? That's what you really want to know. And so grain, soy and corn prices are within 5% of the 2012 highs already. So we think to ourselves, gee, that's pretty high. Are they going to revert? Normally we'd be a bit nervous investing at the top because it might revert to mean. Uh, but I, I just can't see that happen based on the uh, demand supply at the moment. Inventory buffers are at record lows. So you have your, your buffers, your spare capacity, if you want to use that term, uh, for grains, uh, just like you do with, uh, say, oil and gas. And that's at a record low. So you've got a supply dearth, inventory is at its lowest, and you've got demand that will at least stay stable. Uh, so I, I don't think, I think that there's a floor under those prices, at least for now. I don't see them dropping down anytime soon. Then you've got your random factors, so weather. We had a poor harvest over in Brazil this year, and so relying on these overly bullish estimates for cr crop yields is uh, and ending stock levels is uh, probably giving us a false sense of security, I think. Here's a visual on natural gas versus uh, crude versus the corn price, wheat and soybeans over the, the last year. So you can see uh, the energy's outperformed this year. I would expect next year you'll see those uh, bottom three commodities start to rise perhaps even above the, um, in percentage terms, above the energy prices. Energy prices got a long way to go, um, but I think being the end product, those commodities are experiencing a, a lag time. So your input goes up and then you'll see a lag as you go through the production cycle. And when these uh, crops start to come through, you may see that um, they outperform even the energy prices this year. If we go out further, uh, one way to play it is uh, obviously the futures. If you're not familiar with futures, don't bother. Um, <laughs> don't, uh, just make sure you go in and work out and get your head around future contracts first. So has surely you think to yourself, well, the futures have priced in all these factors. So if you look out to next year and the year after and the year after that, that you expect that the prices to be higher than where they are today with the market being in uh, a contango scenario. And as far as I can see, that's not really the case. So most of the commodities are in backwardation, meaning the futures prices are actually lower than current uh, spot prices today, which is, uh, I think, an opportunity potentially. Here you'll see uh, the current price of corn versus the fourth quarter of 2024. So this is a long-term um, futures uh, price for corn. You'll see is trading below the current spot price. Okay, so if you think that the energy crisis is going to be resolved and fertilizer prices will come down and there'll be an abundant supply of corn, which will bring the prices down by 2024, obviously you probably wouldn't be willing to to look at this investment. If you think that the market's got it wrong and you think that energy prices are staying roughly where they are, you may start to think this is an interesting opportunity to buy out uh, future production, so buy this futures contract. And as the market starts to realize, hang on a minute, energy prices aren't going anywhere, food prices are staying you know, flat to even increasing, you can start to potentially make a profit if things uh, go your way. So here's the backwardation curve, super artistic uh, on the old uh, mouse here. So you've got time on the bottom, it's a dependent variable, and then you've got uh, the independent variable, I should say. Then you've got the dependent variable on the um, uh, y-axis or the function of x as the price. And so if today is day zero and we have a certain price and we're looking out into the futures contract, as those futures contracts are priced lower than today, you'll see the price curve start to shift in this direction. If it's the opposite, uh, it goes obviously in an inverted curve with the price in the future being higher than the spot price today with the market said to be in contango. For those of you who are invested in the portfolio on eToro or you're watching the portfolio uh, with interest, how I'm looking to position the portfolio uh, looking out next year and the year after and the year after that. And so we have a heavy weighting to energy and uh, we're fairly diversified there. So with the producers absolutely spitting out free cash flow, we've got um, Canadian Sands, um, Sonovus, uh, just finished off the merger with Husky Energy and will be the largest refiner in uh, Canada, which have some super, super interesting opportunities there. Uh, Ovintiv, uh, Midwest play, uh, very high level, uh, made a mistake hedging their natural gas prices, but they should be able to make a heap of money uh, off oil 
and Gazprom, obviously the Russian powerhouse, um, who hold all the cards in supplying gas to Europe. So you would have seen this in the news with the Nord Stream 2 uh, um, pipeline. Basically, Europe gets gas if Putin allows it, and um, you know if they don't play ball, he just switches the tap off and the prices rise. So um, there's a there's a little synopsis. Services, uh, if you think about you know, the miners, sometimes uh, or often the pick and shovel suppliers to the miners make more money than the miners themselves. So services uh, to the oil industry, we've got rig, okay, a transocean supply deep, she, uh, deep sea and offshore uh, drill rigs and Scorpio uh, tankers. Obviously you need to be able to take the oil and gas uh, from the production site to the refineries and to the end uh, point destination. So tankers are usually a horrible, horrible business, uh, but I think they're entering into their um, their up cycle. And we bought these uh, both these companies for far less than the, the value of their assets. So providing there's not another lockdown next year, um, these guys should be spitting out free cash flow and uh, their price will start to revert to reflect the, the price of their assets. And if we can sell them for liquidation value, um, one times book value, then we're gonna be laughing. We're gonna make multiples on our uh, investment. CF Industries, a, a, a high quality fertilizer producer. I actually think this is probably the best producer in the world. I know people talk about Fosagro, which I'll be uh, probably do a deep dive on um, in another, uh, another video. CF Industries, have increased their profit margins and production. They're doing extremely well. They have a competitive moat. They have uh, geographically where they're situated in the Midwest, they have access to uh, the cheaper natural gas. They're very transport cost efficient because of that geographic location. They've invested in CapEx back in the last cycle. So they don't need to shell out a lot of money at all now uh, to increase their production. Their CapEx has already been done. We came in after the old shareholders helped them uh, do all that. They've bought back hundreds of million dollars worth of, of stock. And so it's been one of our best performers to date. And I think it's got uh, plenty more legs to run. UNFI is a wholesale of premium positioning. You can go and watch the video on all of these companies, by the way, that I've done. And I think that they will have the brand power to price in um, any cost input inflation onto their end consumer without too much of a worry. And so I think that, again, the risk with some of these companies, they do hold quite a bit of debt, but I think that they'll be able to actually benefit from that in an inflationary environment as the real uh, value of their their debt goes down with uh, cheaper inflated dollars. BJ's Warehouse, top performer as of um, as of today. Low cost volume consumer goods, I think we're up nearly 48% on the position so far. They just continue to outperform and um, between their regular recurring revenue from the memberships and people doing their shopping, they are taking market share, increasing their margin. They haven't had any issues with margin squeeze with inflation. And so it continues to, to be a fantastic pick and we'll continue to write it up, uh, maybe even over $100. Uh, I might take some profits after 75 to $78, uh, but I still think it's a, it's a great quality business. If we're talking outside the portfolio, there's many different ways you can do it. You can do you buy the straight commodity. If you're worried about, for example, risk of the Canadians doing something stupid, which they tend to want to do, and messing up uh, production for Sonovas, for example, you might just buy uh, the straight commodity, the oil. You can buy spot oil. You can buy exchange traded vehicles that um, replicate uh, the daily fluctuations in the commodity. You can buy the futures, you can buy futures options. So I, I've started buying some bull call spreads on various different commodities. I find that's a good way to do it, but you do need to understand the options market. Exchange traded vehicles uh, that actually buy futures. So not just the spot, but the futures. Teo Creum is one that I've had my eye on. And normally it's a pretty poor investment because if the market's in, um, if the market's in Contango, you're paying, uh, you're paying more and more for the, the next month's rolling future. And so you're losing money month after month. But with the market in backwardation, obviously that inverts and you'll start to have a positive carry month after month as the, um, the futures market starts to rise to meet the spot price. So that's interesting. I haven't had the heart to do it yet for the portfolio because I think that there are just other ways in which, um, yeah, I don't know if we really need to, to go out into that, um, that sort of complicated trades or anything like that. 
There's stocks, there's, uh, I mentioned CF Industries, but Fosagro is a, an interesting play if you're happy investing in Russia. Nutrien. And then you can always have that um, that fourth order thinking in terms of what, you know, what if things don't go your way and you take heavy positions in the commodities? What happens if the commodity price actually falls for some unknown reason that no one could have thought of um, a priori? You can hedge your, your bets, so you can do straight hedges. Or you can do, this is an interesting way, is you can buy out, um, pro- not producers, but they're more sort of retail um, companies nestle Kellogg, hershey's you can um, do covered calls with them or what is an interesting play if you were to buy for example uh, coca or, or coffee or sugar for nestle or so on and so forth if let's take Kellogg's for example you buy the wheat futures and wheat goes up what you can also do is uh, unless Kellogg do a good job of their hedging their costs are going to go up, their profit margin is going to go down. So you'd expect their share price to actually fall in a rising um, wheat uh, price environment. And so one thing Jim Rogers talks a lot about is that you can um, account for that in your thinking. If you're getting the business starting to drop in share price, you're making a profit off the, the commodity future. You can start to roll that capital into the next play. And then, of course, as the commodity prices stabilize and revert to mean over time, the margins for, say, in this case, Kellogg's with the decreased cost of wheat will start to increase as their, uh, their cereals are cheaper for them, or the input for their uh, cereals are cheaper, and they can start to, to sell them at higher margins. I'm sure you get the idea. Uh, I'm going to try and wrap it up. This is a bit of a big one. Uh, thank you for watching. If you haven't already checked out the portfolio on eToro, click on the link and you'll be taken to the portfolio and you can add us to a watch list. Or if you want in on the action and you want to invest a few funds and share in the gains, you just copy open trades and you're good to go. Thanks for watching. If you haven't already liked and subscribed to the YouTube channel, I would greatly appreciate you doing that. And as always, uh, this is not advice. This is just my thoughts on things and what I'm doing. You need to do your own due diligence and make sure that um, you get the proper advice. I'm not your financial advisor. I have no idea what your situation is. So please make sure you make smart decisions and take responsibility for your actions. Thanks, guys. I'll catch up with you in another video. If there's anything that you uh, want me to talk about in further detail, please leave a comment in the section and I'll do my very best to get around to it. Thank you.